talk about doing business in Japan. Later in the week, I think it's Thursday, you have foreign coming in from the Economist Conference Network to talk about the Japanese economy. Okay? That's a more high level, macro level. I'm going to talk about the nitty gritty, getting your hands dirty in business, right? How, what it's like to do business in Japan. Okay? So we'll get into that. And why am I here? Why am I in Japan? A lot of foreigners are in Japan because they have interest in Japan through anime. That's real, that's, you know, manga, anime. They got interest in Japan from that book. For me, it was what I call a chambara, a Japanese sword drama. This is called uh, Onmitsu Kenshi. It was broadcast in the 1960s, before the Tokyo Olympics in 64. Also, Koichi is the actor here, is dressed up as a samurai. And I was probably, I don't know, 10 or 11 in Australia. Half an hour show, dubbed into English. Amazing. Amazing. When you've grown up on American Westerns, you know, Winnie Mattel, the Vikings, all the sort of Western stuff for kids, for boys. You know, boys sort of, you know, fighting and stuff like that. And then out pop these guys, wearing kimono wearing the zori, the sandals, bamboo forests, swords, fighting with ninja, shuriken. How cool. When you're 10, 11 years old as a boy in Australia, that's pretty cool stuff. So that, that piqued my interest. And that led to... That led to that. I took up karate training. I was about 17. I'm still training. I was about, what, 40... 46, is it 46? Yeah, about 46 years ago I started. So, still going. And my son, actually, on the, your right, he got his black belt last year and then quit, took up basketball instead, yeah. much to his father's chagrin. But, you know, thoughts of father and son trained together, whoosh, they went out the window. But it's from these interests we, we start to learn about different parts of Japan not just business. And what I found was interesting. It's like a, it's like a time war. And it's probably something, something similar in Chinese culture too, with Tai Chi Chuan, Wing Fu, these, Chung, Wing Chi, these sorts of things. That world has not modernized at all. It just has not modernized. There's a culture and a status system and a way of doing things that is, goes back hundreds of years. Same, I found with Karate World. There's a certain core of the concepts of this which go all the way back through samurai society. And my exposure to this world helped me a lot to understand aspects of Japanese culture that I'd never understand, ever. Some really deep core. So that was quite interesting for me. And then, about 10 years ago, I bought this company. It's a franchise business. There are 200 of these franchise businesses around the world. Dale Cunningham started the business in 1912 in New York. And he never imagined it would be a global organization like it is today and then be going strong well after he passed. So there are some basic things in that golden book you've got there, some basic things which are universal and timeless which the human condition never gets beyond needing it. We always need it. Every generation needs it. So I believe this company will last forever, basically. And it's interesting because I say 1912. In 1912, there were some very powerful companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange. I mean powerful companies. He started his business in 1912. Today, how many of those companies in America who are on the New York Stock Exchange, big powerful companies in 1912, do you think are left today? One. GE. His company is still going. All those big powerful companies are all gone. But he's still going. That's very interesting. How do you have that longevity? How do you keep going through the decades, especially after your founder has passed on? Oh, very interesting. So Don Carnegie is training 90% of the Fortune 500 companies. That's a very important number because 
The Fortune 500 companies in the States are the most wealthy, most powerful companies in America. They can have anybody. They can choose anybody to train them. But 90% choose data training. It says a lot about there's something going on in this training that really, really works. And if you're running your own business in the future or you're working in a company, testimonials are important. With social media, we rely on the common man and woman's voice. You're on Amazon. What do people say about this product? What do your friends say about their experience with this service? We rely on that. And companies can't control that anymore. It's very innocent. So testimonials from people we trust are very, very critical in making buying decisions. I'm going to hope that everyone here in this room knows who Warren Buffett is. Anyone not know who Warren Buffett is? You all good? I think Warren Buffett would have to be the most successful investor, businessman in history. I don't think anyone has done as well as he has. Yet, this is a take from CBS News. It wouldn't matter whether it's BBC, NHK, it wouldn't matter. Whatever he does, these interviews. In fact, there's a new documentary out on Warren Buffett that I haven't seen yet, but I've seen the grabs. Same thing. This is his office in Omaha. And there's an arrow pointing to a certificate on that wall. And he makes the point himself. He says, I don't have my graduation certificate from university. I don't have my master's degree. On my wall, I have my Dale Carnegie certificate. And here's the, here's the killer testimonial, right? This is what you in business lie awake at night praying for. Someone of his status says, it changed my life. <laughs> How good is that? Now, we can't afford to pay Warren Buffett to say that, trust me. The guy's a multi-billionaire. What would we pay to Warren Buffett? We don't pay Warren Buffett anything. But he says that of his own accord because it really did register with him. And this is the point. Getting strong testimonials in business, when people are more worried about fake news, right? And alternate facts, words we didn't know about until a few months ago, right? It's becoming like that. There's so much disinformation. There's so much fishing going on on the net. We've got to be very careful these days what we do. So getting this type of testimonial from very credible people is very, very important in business. And the local version is also important too. So uh, Murakami Noyo-san, he, as a young man in his 30s, took the Dale Tony course. And that golden book you have there, he would read that every day. And he practiced the principles. And he became a leader and just succeeded in his career. As all of our graduates find the same thing. As their human relations skills improve, their business success improves too. If you're an entrepreneur, well, guess what? You've got to convince people to come and work for you. With no track record, you're a startup. If you're running a little section for your company, you've got to get people to believe in the vision of the company and come with you. It's all persuasion, it's all people skills. That's what he found was important. He's a big fan. So, again, you need a local version. We have lots of local versions of this because he's ex chairman, or chairman of Google. I put that up there. Again, Google credibility, you see. So, 100 countries around the world, and also now teaching in 30 languages. Dale Carnegie Japan was started about the same time as Dale Carnegie Hong Kong. And the same day started it. You're sitting now in the Machizuki room. And next door is the Whitlow room. A guy called Whit Whitlow was a, what they call a sponsor for the franchise business in those days. He got franchise then, but a sponsor. He was based in Hawaii. And he opened up Asia to Dale Carnegie. Very entrepreneurial guy. Because in those days, you know, flying around Asia, not that easy. We're talking the 50s and 60s here, right? Not that easy. He'd come here, teach for two weeks, go back to Hawaii. He, he opened up in Hong Kong, Philippines. He opened up in Indonesia, Japan too. So now we're all around the world. Why is that important? Multinational companies have global operations. Delta. We need nine countries for Delta for training. We developed customized training for them, delivered in nine countries in those languages. That's important because companies want to have all of their people go up 
at the same time. They don't want this. This is here, this is here. And they don't want this sort of training, you know. Oh, uh, Vivian came in, did the training. Oh, Vivian was just awesome trainer, fantastic experience. Vivian rocked. Vivian, you rocked. You were great. And then Greg turns up, and Greg's like, okay, average, but no, not like Vivian. Companies don't like that. They like consistency of service. Now, if you're in the manufacturing business, that's easier to regulate. Machines will do that for you if you keep the systems working properly. But in a service business, it's very hard to get consistency of service. One of the attributes of Dow Canning is we're able to do that. So in all of those countries, we do the same training in exactly the same way with the same intensity. That's important. So how do you get consistency? Well, now, your Golden Books are in Japanese version, but there are 30 human relations principles. This is the first one. I'm going to go through all 30. This is the first one. It's the only negative one. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. And the same. When you read those principles, those 30 human relations principles, you go, oh, yeah, I got it. Well, yes. Intellectually, you've got it. Try doing it for a day. Try doing that for one day. Just try it for one day. Not so easy. That's where it's hard. That's why you need training. You read the book, watch the TED talk, read the article, but how do you get it out of here and into here? This is where applied knowledge is everything. And theoretical knowledge is important, but applied knowledge in business is everything. And human relations principles are a key area. Now, one of the things we're not good at, and you'll find this in business, in our speciality area, which is training, delivering training, we are really good. We are at the top of the tree. We are at the top of the tree. Nobody, nobody, nobody in the world delivers training better than we do. Nobody. Straight up. Because our system of developing trainers, no one tries that hard. No one puts in that much effort. No one invests that much money. Fine. But our marketing is dreadful. This is the problem in business. You can have a great product, like we have, but if your marketing is not working, there's a problem. Now, on that rack of books over there, you'll see there's a lot of dark cunning books. How to Win Friends and Influence People, Global Bestseller. Dale Carnegie was an overnight success that took 24 years. Okay. 1912, he starts, book gets published in 36, explodes. Explodes globally. He's a superstar, instant superstar. J.W. Rowley's first billionaire author, overnight success. It took her years. Same with Dale Carnegie. Now, here's the point. That book came 24 years after he started his training company. But that book dominates the training company. People know the book. They don't know there's a training company behind it. So it's an irony of business that something that's so well known can actually <coughs> cannibalize your capacity to market, the training. They all know the book, they don't know about the training company. And I don't think Dale Carnegie as an organization has been tremendous in marketing. So you'll find we do lots of things. This is from just a screenshot from our YouTube channel. We've got 500 and nearly 30 videos on YouTube because we're trying to push out marketing. Marketing is so important. I do three podcasts a week and if you have an interest in business, if you're interested in presentation skills, it's free, it's on every week. If you're interested in sales skills, here's a quick question. Who here is interested in sales skills? So one person who's sort of half sure, that means the rest of you are not going into business then. Is that what that means? You're going to become librarians? Can you go out and teach us? Is that what happens for you in your next stage of your career? If you're in business, trust me, you're in sales. And it doesn't matter. Lawyers, they have to compete with each other. It's called business development, but it's something. Architects, engineers, accountants, doesn't matter any of the so-called professions. These days, the business development component of those careers is huge, except they are never trained. They are never trained on selling. At all. And then they wonder. Huh? So you didn't raise your hands, but you're already in sales. You just don't know it yet. 
Now you can be in sales and not know it and be hopeless, or you can realize you're in sales and study. Because it doesn't matter what you're in. What's your name? Sorry. Sorry? Tintin. Tintin? Yes. Where should we go for lunch today, Tintin? I don't know. I think we should go Japanese. That's a sale right there. I'm making a suggestion to her on what we should do for lunch and where we should go. That's a sale. I'm selling my idea, my suggestion, my opinion to her. That's a sale. Let's do this project rather than that project. That's a sale. Let's put more money over here than here. That's a sale. Let's say this is the priority list. That's a sale. Promote me. That's a sale. Give me a bigger job. That's a sale. Give me more money. That's a sale. So, even though you don't think you're in selling, we're all in selling. Only the smart people realize it. The people who aren't that smart don't realize it. They struggle. So, it's free. And then leadership. Okay. Leadership. Now, if you want to be a leader, listen to this podcast. It's free. It's on iTunes. How hard can that be? But study these things because you can't just anymore escape and think you're in just one narrow band anymore. You're not. Business requires all of your facilities, all of your capabilities. This is uh, LinkedIn. So using all the business social media, this is just one example. Uh, at the time of I put this together, it was about uh, 460 articles. It's actually now over... I think it's over 500 now. Articles on LinkedIn are about six to 800 words long. Full blogs, it's up there, free business content. Posted one this morning. I do two postings a day on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. One on uh, one in Japanese this morning, and after I finish here, I'll do one in English. I, I do one in the morning when Japanese are commuting, and I do one around about lunchtime before people go to lunch. And I'm pumping up twice a day on those three. I, I don't do Snapchat, just don't have bandwidth. I don't do much on Instagram, a little bit on Instagram. But there's a limit on how much you can do. When you're posting every day, trust me, that's a lot. But you know, in doing that, this now says what, 7,300 followers? It's now nearly 8,000. Because I'm posting every day. I'm building up, I'm building up fans, I'm building up followers. I'm doing that personally, we also have the data coming in, so I do. We need to connect, we need to have credibility in business, personal credibility and brand credibility. We want to be the expert authority in our business. Now, whatever business you go into, you want to be the expert authority on that subject. That's what this is about. By putting out hundreds of articles, hundreds of videos, posts of podcasts, like the leadership one, it'll go out on Thursday morning, it's 204th episode. The one on sales presentations, 30th episodes. I niche them down. I started with one and then I niche them down to three. The whole point here is we have to engage our audience and say, hey, top of mind, you're after training, come here. After whatever it is you're going to do, come to me. I know about that. So Japan is about to go on a demographic diet. And you'll see what I mean here. These are ages, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, men, women, and you see this big bulge, right? Big bulge here. We've got sort of 45, 15, down about probably, you know, 20s, and then again, sort of, you know, 50 to 60. That's where we are now. That's where we are now. In a very short space of time, which is not very far away, 2030, not far away, this part is starting to disappear. That means the youth market is shrinking. That has a lot of ramifications. It has ramifications around market size. It has ramifications around staffing. Directly opposite here is a Lawson convenience store. Okay. So I recommend you go there. Anyone here speak Mandarin? You put them hahama. <laughs> Go next door and try your Putunghua because they all speak Mandarin. You won't find many Japanese over there. A 
and that's happening everywhere. Can't employ enough young people. Delivery companies can't keep up with Amazon, Surge, online shopping, same day delivery. Same day delivery. Think about it. You order in the morning, it arrives that day. Convenience stores running 24 hours a day. That's all got to change. Because there's not enough staff to, staff to, we can't get enough Chinese students here. When I came here as a student in 1979, you could barely work five hours a week. It was very, very small. Now, in Japan, as a student, you can work 38 hours a week. How many hours a week do they work in France? 35. In France, they work 35 hours a week, standard work week. As a student, you can work 38 in Japan. Guess what? All those Chinese students aren't going to school. They're working 38 hours a week to make money. There's going to be more of that. The construction industry doesn't have enough young people. Farming industry, no young people. How does that survive? We need to have immigration. They don't want immigration. Harmony, societal harmony is value. So, this is going to create some real challenges for Japan going forward. So if we compare, you see how it changes them. Market size is shrinking, workforce is shrinking. A lot of things that we demand now in terms of convenience are going to change. That's a decline. This is 18 to 34 year olds from 2010 to 2060. That's hard. We bring that from 0 to 70, same thing. So basically, 0 to 34 is halving between now and 2060. Halving, and that's big. That's big. Big ramifications for business people. One of the issues we're facing now is security. It's security of your online presence. We had WannaCry, global attack. Global attack. I Personally, I have a personal email account, I have a business account, a personal email account. On my personal email account, I would get, on average, on average, every single day, two emails trying to look like FedEx, telling me that <coughs> Michael's story has just died and left 60 million bucks, and I'm the only surviving relative, or I'm the minister for oil in Libya, and I've parked 40 million dollars in this bank account, and if I do blah, 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 and this goes on and on and on. So there are once fake sites trying to look like real ones, to get me to click on this link, download this virus, and then there are ones trying to get me to give them my information. They work on the basis of numbers. There are greedy, stupid people who'll do it. You've got to worry about your personal security and business. You've got to worry about being attacked online as well in your business. You're going to have this problem. You're going to be at work. Email's going to pop up. You click on it. Boom. Whole companies up to ransom. This is our personal security. Now, for Japan, we also have North Korea. We don't have good relations with South Korea because of the, what we call Takushima, they call Gokto Islands. We have trouble now with China because of the Senko, you know, the islands, the Kaku Islands. This is not going away. So one of the challenges for Japan is how do you have a difficult political relationship with a major trading partner, which is what China is. Very, very tricky for Japan to navigate that. Now the people navigating it are not very good. That's straight up, they're just not very good. They're not very good at it. So Japan is going to have a long-term problem here as far as relations. And that flows on to business because you might remember the Chinese turned off the rare metals exports. You remember that about a year ago? A year and a half ago? They just suddenly said, all these rare earth metals we've been exporting, we're going to use them for ourselves now. Boom. So it's kind of like that. Now all this stuff goes into all this high tech that we're wearing, using. This is a big problem. This is a big problem. So this is something that we're all going to face going forward. How do we deal 
you are in a very tricky position because you're inside China, but you're not in China. Taiwan, same thing. All those Taiwanese companies invested in China. Very tricky. How's that going to work? Your Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the US dollar. So you have that sort of fluctuation, basically. In Japan, we don't have that. It fluctuates. And we've had massive swings, massive swings in the yen. And when the yen gets weak, export goes up and profits go up. And when it goes strong, they go down. But it's a tricky balance because it's a big importer of energy. So if you've got a strong yen, it makes the energy cheaper. But then when you're trying to sell stuff, it makes it more expensive. So Japan's in a real, real tricky position around the yen, the yen dollar currency trade. So for all companies who are here trying to project costs, what are we going to do here? What will we, what will we sell for overseas, set a price on that, and then you know, the currency movement change, suddenly what was profitable becomes unprofitable. We report in two ways in Dale Carnegie. Every month we report in yen against the yen target. That's okay. But when they come to the end of the year and they look at all the countries around the world, they switch it into dollars. So, if we've got a really strong yen, we look terrific. We look terrific because we've done really well. Same yen amount, but it's this many dollars. And then the next year, the currency switches, we look like idiots. Same yen amount, but it's only worth this much. That's the reality for companies. How do you forward hedge that? How do you control that risk? Donald Trump, lunatic, dollar goes down. I'm going to cut taxes. I'm going to cut regulations. Dollar goes up. He's working for the Russians. Goes down again. You know, that is fluctuations. How are you in business? How do you control that? You can't control that. Who knows what on earth Donald Trump's going to do? Nobody knows what he's going to do. So your business, up and down. Is anyone here trading currency? Anyone buying currency? Anyone trading currency at all? Personally? It's a risky business, but a lot of people are trading, personally trading. They're saying, buy on the dips. And the US goes down, buy. Expecting to go back up again, sell their profit, right? So there's a lot of people invested in this. And trade barriers. The Americans talk about trade barriers. They talk about cars. You just arrived yesterday. Okay. You're in Minato-ku. This is called Minato-ku. Minato-ku is the Beverly Hills of Japan. Ever been to Beverly Hills, California, LA? It's got lots of luxury cars there. I mean, you know, Maseratis and Lamborghinis and Ferraris and Maybachs and Bentleys and Rollers and Mercs and what do you know? They've got the works there. Guess what? When you're walking around here, have a look at the cars. Don't say, oh, another Toyota. Forget that. Look around. You'll see a lot of luxury cars here. They're all European. But the Americans are saying, oh, Japan's got trade barriers against American cars. Fiat has had a number of brands. One of them is the Jeep brand. Just going like gangbusters. Selling them year on year. Just going up. Just going like that. Doing terrific business. The Americans, not so. But this is going to become a lot of pressure on Japan. Now they're getting back into TPP. When they had the TPP and America said no, Australia and New Zealand said, OK, let's have the TPP anyway. And Japan said, forget it. If America's not in, we're out. Then the Trump gets in, they go, oh, whoa, this guy's going to dismantle the free trade system of the world. We've got to get TPP back on the rails. We're back in. In fact, we're leaving. Right? That's what they're saying now. So these things have major applications for business around pricing, competition, export, access, all of these things. If we're going into America first, then what's that going to mean for your company? Especially a trading hub. Oh, you're a trading hub. What's that going to mean? Will the access no longer be there? 
safe in Japan. Where are we going with this? And this is typical Japanese business meeting. I don't know your company. I don't know your company's reputation. I don't know your company's financial situation. I don't know your product. I don't know your reliability. I don't know about your guarantees. I'm not sure about your quality. I don't know you. What was it you wanted to sell me again? Extreme doubt. This is what you face in Japan. Risk averse. Don't like things that are new. Don't like things that are risky. These two characters, that's the face you get in a lot of meetings here when you're trying to bring new things in. I worked in trade for 12 years in Japan, bringing in Australian products and services to Japan. Got a lot of that. It's always new. Now, in business, you're often the new. In this country, being new, not a plus. You know this expression in English? Maybe you know. The devil you know. Have you heard that expression? The devil you know. Never heard of it? Okay, it's an English expression. We normally only use the first half. We just say the devil you know because we know the rest of it. The devil you know is better than the angel you don't know. Now, an angel would be better than a devil, except if you don't know the angel. That's Japan. They'd rather the devil they know than the angel they don't know. You might be the angel. Your company might be the angel. You might have a fantastic product, a fantastic system, fantastic pricing, fantastic differentiation value, all of that stuff. But they don't know you. So if you cold call companies, very hard to get through. If you send them information by email, delete. You send them by letter, straighten the bin. This is straight up. Don't know who you are, bang, you're out. Now, a friend of mine, Alex Delaglazia, I think you've met Alex, right? Lived in Japan many, many years. So he moves to Hong Kong. He starts a business in Hong Kong. So I said, you go for a tip. So he says, uh, I said, Alex, I said, you know, Alex, you, you worked in Japan many years. We worked together in the Shinsei Bank, right, together. And I said, what's it like in Hong Kong compared to Japan? He said, ah, Hong Kong. People in Hong Kong want to do business. When you go to networking, they want to find out if there's somewhere to make some money together. They want to, you know, partner up. They want to make it happen. In Japan, no. When you go to networking events in Japan, people don't network. This is how we'll network. Sorry, what's your name? Jane. Jane. Yes. I know Jane. Jane knows Vivian. So, I meet Jane. Jane introduced me to Vivian. That's it. Right? That's it. Walking up to people you don't know at a networking event in Japan, you don't see it very much. They get in their little groups and they go from there. I'll go to a lot of different chamber events in different foreign chambers, American chamber, British chamber, German chamber, Australian New Zealand chamber, whatever. Right? Big room, big speaker. You walk in there, the Japanese are sitting. It hasn't started yet. They're all sitting. They walk in and they sit straight down. That's not how you network, is it? How do you network when you're sitting down? No concept. So it's very, very hard here to get to meet new people. You've got to really step out. So, as a foreigner, I do that, you know. I step out. I walk up to people. Let me meet you. How do you do? I do it that way. Honestly, that's the reaction. I don't know you. This is a network event, okay? <laughs> totally different. So, those barriers, why are those barriers there? There are no second chances in Japan. If you're bankrupt, you're out. If you're in a company, you screw up, you're finished. Now, you may not get fired, but you're never going to rise. HR, they got the book. Jane made a mistake. No. She and Vivian entered the company at the same time. 
lockstep promoted on age and years of seniority. So you get to the top of the triangle, there's no more way to go. Right? Someone's got to go up, someone's got to go sideways. Ah, Jane made a mistake. Congratulations, Vivian! You proceed to the next level, Jane. You go nowhere. That's the fear. Because that's how it happens. Or well, when the HR department says, we're transferring Jane to the outer reaches of Hokkaido, where they get 15 feet of snow a year or something, right? That's what happens. So people are very much trained, don't make a mistake. Now, do you know what's the best way not to make a mistake? What do you think? What's the best way to never make a mistake? Do less. Do nothing. Take no, no stand. No decision making. Don't do anything new. Don't think you're vaguely risky. That's how it works in Japan. Now, you turn up, and you turn up, and you turn up, and you turn up, and you turn up trying to sell something. Who are you? I don't know your company, I don't know your product, I don't know you. All that list I went through before, that's the reality. Resistance, major resistance. So it's very hard to break in here. Very hard to break in. That risk aversion is built in. We are always a new decision for them. So it's very hard to get people to say yes. Very easy for people to say no. That's, just, that's how it is. We're not going to change Japan. So you've got to find ways through that. How to meet people, how to convince them, how to get them involved. That's what we need to do. And if you're going to be dealing with Japan, that's what you're going to need to learn how to do as well. Because that's how it is. It's very tough. Very, very tough. So decision making, I did a PhD. And if you want to be an academic, that's your union card. If you want to be a professor, that's your union card. You need a PhD. So I want to be a professor, so I got a PhD. And I did my PhD in Japanese decision making about Chinese, or actually Japanese decision making about assistance, economic assistance, into Chinese economic development. I was studying where the Japanese put the money to help China back in the 80s, when they were doing double tracking of railways, port expansion, small power, hydroelectric plants, all that sort of infrastructure. Because coming from Australia, all of our resources got taken out of the ground and moved to the port and the ships through Japanese money. They put in the railways, put in the ports. And this is the same in China. All the resources are in the middle of the country. How does Japan get them out so they can lower the price, Brazilian iron ore, coal, whatever it is, bring the price down because you have global oversupply. That was the plan. So I was looking at the decision making on the Japanese side about where they would put the money. So, when people ask me, oh, yeah, well, what was your PhD on? And I just give a short answer. I say Japanese decision making in Japan. Everyone laughs. Everyone laughs. Because getting a decision here is very difficult. So it's like an oxymoron studying Japanese decision making. Because they don't make a decision because of all this risk aversion. So here I am doing this whole issue of decision making. And it's very hard to know here. Japanese don't want to make a single decision. They want the group to make the decision so if it goes bad, Everybody's responsible, and therefore nobody's responsible. They're having a huge problem at the moment, as you probably read. Toxicity in the soil over in the Toyosu site where they're planning to move the Skidgy fish market. Has anyone seen anything in the media since this has come out about who's responsible for that decision? The original decision was we would take out all the bad toxic soil and we'd replace it, and we'd build on top of it. What actually happened was, they didn't do that. They dug down deeper, and they made these huge underground tunnels to move stuff around more easily. So they didn't take the soil out, they just dug deeper. So they made that decision. You cannot find the decision maker. This is Japan, no one's responsible. We're all responsible, no one's responsible. So how do you get someone to take a decision to make you the new supplier? 
That's very, very tricky. There's no sense of urgency either. This is the work rhythm in Japan. Like that. What's the work rhythm in Hong Kong? I bet it's like this. Maybe like that. Fast pace. Let's go. Australia too. Come in, go hard, go home. In Japan, come in, hang around, hang around, hang around, hang around, hang around, finally go home. Come back the next day. Hang around, hang around, hang around, hang around. Long work days. Now, when you're catching the train to work in Japan, it's packed. It's packed. You're like this <coughs> for a long period of time. So by the time you get to work, you're already tired. You're already tired. Then you have this work long hours because you're waiting. You're waiting for the section head. You're waiting for the division chief to go home so you can go home. So you're just hanging around. Has anyone heard of Parkinson's law? Parkinson did a study of the British Navy bureaucracy and he found that the content of the work, the actual core amount of work, expands to fill the time. So if you have this amount of work and you do it in six hours, you'll do it in six hours. If you've got eight hours, you'll do it in eight hours. It's not like you're trying to get through the work more urgently, but let's get more done in the same amount of time. That's logical, right? More done, same amount of time, productivity. But not here. Not here. So the sense of urgency is not there. It's works expanding to fill the long hours. So it's very hard to get things done quickly here. We have rule of law. China? Do they have rule of law in China? It's on video, so you can just sort of blink if you want to tell me an answer. The answer is no. There's no rule of law in China. There's no rule of law there. It's a wild west. Hong Kong? I'd say semi-rule of law. Probably used to have rule of law. Now, I'm not so sure. But Japan, you have rule of law. That's good. That's very, very good. Because if there's a dispute, it'll go to court. You'll have a fair chance. You won't be influenced by payments. You won't be influenced by relations, relatives, and all the sort of stuff that goes on. That means level playing field is a good thing. There are dirty tricks here. When I was in the trade business, I'm trying to bring in Australian products and services. These are better priced, very competitive, but you know what happened? Our competitors go to the buyers and say, that company, very financially unsound, probably going to go bankrupt. They've got no idea about the financial situation of that Australian company at all. It doesn't stop them from saying it. So spread rumours, make up staff, no problem. There's lots of stuff goes on here. When you have a lot of joint ventures in Japan, staff are coming in from various companies. Often they've got personal connections. So they're trying to further themselves within that company's decision making for their own benefit against you, the outsider. Japanese companies will collude to force you out. They will have an agreement. Okay, we collectively will take a hit on the price. Vivian's company is going to take the lead. They're going to drop their price by 80% take a big hit, but that price drop will drive the foreign competitor out of the country. And when they're gone, when the contracts are back on, we'll all help Vivian's company get the new contracts to pay back the money that they lost, because we all collectively got rid of the competitor. These are dirty tricks. Very hard to compete against that. You don't have the corruption here of putting money in an envelope 
and sliding it under the table. But it's a country of gift giving. Lots of gifts. Now where's the, where's the line between gift and bribery? It's very tricky. When I was in banking, I was working in banking, it was very, very difficult because of the Western anti-corruption regulations around compliance. Very tricky. Recently, we were at Mazda. 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 Big car company. You've heard of Mazda, I'm sure. We took some cookies and a couple of books to Mazda. Very typical, you bring a little present, right? They said, sorry, can't take the cookies. Can't, by rule of the company, cannot take them. The books were put in the, were put in the library, so that'll be okay. I won't take a purse, I'll go alone. That's even in Japan. Companies like that are doing that sort of thing. It's never happened before. Of course you brought the cookies, of course you brought the cookies. So where does the entertainment line draw? We go to the golf, we go to the club, we go to the hostess bar. We do all the stuff, right? I'm paying for it. Where's the line between corruption and non-corruption? Very murky, very grey area. Often you're competing with a rival company and their founder's grandfather took the target company's grandfather out for clubs and bars and golf. It's been going on for generations. And you turn up with your squeaky new wonderful widget and you're competing with that. It's a, it's a type of bribery, but it's very unclear where that line is. And that's often you compete with vested interest because of those long established relations. This is tough. It's extremely tough. So when I came here in 1979, they used the word cocksaker a lot. Everything was cocksaker, internationalization. Japan's becoming more international. Well, Tokyo, I can tell you today, compared to 1979, massively more international city, no question. But today, we're talking about global car, globalization. I don't know, what's the difference between internationalization and globalization? I don't know. Well, what's interesting for me is, that was 1979. This is 2017. We're still talking about the same idea. That tells you how slowly things change here. They're still dealing with it. They haven't gotten there yet. Now this is a handy four quadrant construct. You might think, well, culture is very critical in business. You're coming from a Chinese culture, or an Indian culture, or an Australian culture, or a Japanese culture, or an American culture, or a German culture, and therefore, you will be like that. Not true. Not true. You will be like you. West Coast Americans, East Coast Americans, Midwestern Americans, Southern Americans, different. Northern Germany, Southern Germany, different. Hong Kong compared to mainland China, different. Different parts of China, different. What well, can we look at though? Individuals. Some people are very people oriented. When you're making decisions, they think they worry. How will the people feel about this new decision? Can we get everybody behind the new direction? Right? They're concentrating on the people part. People are Others, time is money. Outputs, outcomes, results. Make it happen. I want it now. Go, go, go. Task driven. Very typical in the military. Okay? We are going to take Hill 101. You are all going to die. But we will take Hill 101. That's the military. Task is everything. People are expendable. They get that in companies. Hard driving, shut job. Hard driving company presidents, section heads. Go, go, go. Right? People are expendable. Then you've got people who are not very assertive. Don't share their opinion, quietly spoken. You know, people are very assertive. Happy to tell you what your opinion should be. Very confident, very loud, outgoing. 
When you make two judgments, you can work out basically where people sit. When you meet people, try and work out, is this person low in assertion terms or high? Decision one. Decision two, are they more outcome oriented or more people oriented? That construct, can anyone make two decisions? Can you guys capable of making two decisions? If you can make those two decisions, you can plot where people are. If they're people oriented, but they're assertive, they're what we call expressive. Often salespeople, actors, trainers are like that. Confident, happy, like people. If they're assertive, but they're task oriented, often the CEO, the founder, startup founder, driver, <coughs> don't care about the people, we can make this happen. If they're people oriented, but not so assertive, they like people, you know, kindergarten teacher, librarians, you know, quiet, softly spoken, let's have a cup of tea, get to know each other. If they're task oriented but not assertive, accountants, CFOs, scientists, right? lawyers, engineers, detailed, very, three decimal places is welcome here. Right? We like three decimal places over here. So depending on the person, you might be, let's see, what nationalities have we got? We've got, we got Chinese, what else have we got here? Australian, what else have we got? Yeah. Indian, anything else? Kazakh. Kazakh, yeah, anything else? Mexican, okay? Quite a, a differentiation, right? Doesn't matter. This is more important than your Kazakhness or your Mexicanness or your Aussiness, because this is you. If you are here, guess what? You're a detail-oriented person. When I'm talking to you, I'd better start putting in more proof, more data, more testimonials, more numbers, because that's what you're looking for. The opposite is here. Big picture. Strategy. Where's the whiteboard? Give me that marker. Let's do the strategy now. Ah, don't bother me with those minor details. I don't want to fill out the CRM report, customer relationship management report in sales. I don't want to do the paperwork. It's poor. You know? I want to be with the customers. That's where I should be. Typical salespeople. If you're here, time is money. When you walk into their office, don't waste their time. There's three reasons we should do this. One, two, three, let's do it. Yes, no, very quick. They're happy with that. They're happy with that. They don't get offended. Don't waste my time. I get, you know, get out of my office, I'm busy. But these people, Jane, let's have a cup of tea. Let's get to know each other. Right? Take our time. So when you get with these people, you drop your voice. You become a little bit less loud. Body language, turn it right down. This one, loud voice, turn it up, more energy. Now if you're not high energy, you've got to become high energy. If you're high energy, you're going to become low energy. If you're not outgoing, you're going to become outgoing. If you're not data detail oriented, you're going to become data detail oriented. And you're going to change your language. But what happens is, you'll be one of these more than the others. And you'll be like that with everybody. But in business, people are different. And this is much more important than their nationality. If you think about it, right? Now, we are all of these things. Me, I'm a driver. I'm a time is money, let's go. You're all gonna die, we take the hill, sort of guy. But, when I'm dealing with the company finances, the accounting, I'm gonna move over here. When I'm training, when I'm teaching, when I'm leading, when I'm managing, I'm going to be up here, more people are When I'm selling, I hardly ever go here. I just don't go there, ever. I'll go here, mainly here, but I'll move around. We're all like that. You'll have some preferences. Your ability to speak four languages is critical. Each of those requires a different language. That's what you need to be able to speak in business. Four languages. So when you meet someone, Decision one, what's decision one? Assertion, high or low. What's decision two? Task or people. If you can remember that, when you meet people from now on, make the assumption. Oh, high assertion, low assertion. Task oriented, people oriented. Once you know that, switch your language. 
Go more detail. Go more big picture. Go more energy. Go less energy. Mirror them. Then guess what happens? They like dealing with you because they feel, oh, you know, Vivian and I, we're on the same wavelength here. This is good. You know, we understand each other. That's the point of business, right? Very simple thing to do. Dry versus wet. The dry is the driver type. I said before, we call the Japanese dry. They're not, they're not emotional. Hard business types. The wet, emotional, how people feel. Japan is like that. They like the wet more than the dry. And tatemai versus hone. Tatemai is the preferred reality, right? What we want to show. And the hone is the actual reality. That's why some people say, oh, Japanese are two-faced. No. They have a public face and they have a private face. Public face, harmony. Private, different. So you've got to differentiate between these. So what are you talking about? Are we getting a tatemai here or are we getting a hone? Is it real or is it just the superficial reality I'm getting? Now, I've signed very few contracts in Japan for training. We meet the client, we agree the terms, I set a proposal, they agree, okay, on this date, training will turn up. That's done. Sometimes for the foreign companies, I get the contracts. They're unbelievable. I got one for a big international company, big drink company, that said, I would not go to court. I gave up the right to go to court to resolve any disputes. Think about that. I say in the contract, I give up the right to go to court to solve any disputes. How can that possibly work? But that was in the contract. So you've got very loyal Western American, particularly litigious, litigious, I should say, orientation here. And in Japan, handshake. It's still like that here. It's a handshake. It's an agreement. Gentleman's agreement, we say. Emotional versus unemotional. You think. Oh, Japanese are unemotional. They're unbelievably emotional. It's quite striking. The devil they know is an emotional idea. That's not a logical idea. That's an emotional idea. They work off emotion. I know you, I trust you, so I'll use you. They could be a lot better, but I know you, I trust you, I'll use you. That's emotional, that's not logical. It's not like, oh, I've got five yen cheaper deal going on here. I'll go for that one. They'll give up the money because they value the trust, which is an emotional judgment. There's trouble with Japan with innovation. Everyone's got to fit in. You have to be like everybody else. That's not in how innovation works. Innovation is something different, something new, something differentiated. But Japan, uh, no thank you. We all want to be the same, fit in with everybody else. So it's very hard to stand out and be innovative in this country works against it, culturally.